talk about an open source space and object. There are quite a few people doing quite some things. You probably tell them the program to start to. Uh, this is my experiences and the experiences of that project. Um, so, John Neary asked um, for a data logger system uh, for some work he was doing uh, in April this year. Uh, I think he might have asked me in March, but he was leaving in April. So, the first iteration of the project was very rushed, as you can see, is a common theme in doing this. Um, and in looking around for uh, low cost data logging solutions, <coughs> one of the highest Google things was Matt Little's Data Duino board, um, which you can as a um, Arduino compatible SD card worker. Um, how many people have actually got experience with Arduino in the room? Just a bit of a show of hands. Okay, so less than a half. You've presumably all kind of heard it, at least it's been said quite a lot over the last few days. Um, it was the obvious choice really as a sort of open source platform. And the way it tends to work, as Matt talks about, is this shield concept. <coughs> so a standard Arduino board at the bottom is a processor you can add shields to take different inputs and outputs to that standard base board. Um, so I thought I'd make a shield to um, achieve what I needed. At the time, Matt hadn't developed his wind resource login, or certainly hadn't released it. Um, so all that I was using was the actual data Arduino board, and I created a plugin looking prototype board there, which could take current and voltage inputs, and also the anemometer um, and wind direction inputs onto that board, which we swapped on the top, um, and put, put it in a package along with some sensors. So yes, uh, Matt's got this, and I guess it on display tomorrow. People can have a look at it. Uh, this is the his homemade version, uh, which is very good of, of that sort of commercial product, which is a, a Hall effect current sensor. And you just put the current, all of the current the system goes through that, um, and the thing that was at the bottom would give you a varying voltage depending on how much current is going through it. You can log to your, uh, to your SD card. Um, so a set of 10. How much current can it take? Sorry? How much current can it uh, take? They all look about the same. Um, that little white thing there selects whether it's a 50 amp, 100 amp, 150 or 200 amp uh, version. I think I set the selection of them because they're different. Thing. And obviously the resolution is always going to be between 0 and 5 volts, so you have to kind of match it to what you want um, to be recording, or you can write the very bottom of the scale. Um, and then we sent over two different anemometers, both of which were quite expensive compared to the $3 <laughs> <laughs> um, And we discussed that, and we decided to go for that. But yeah, that was what we sent out on that first iteration. Um, and it had some issues. So uh, the first interesting one was that there was uh, about 80 meters between the, from memory, something like that, between the anemometer and the logging system. And uh, it was quite a thin sort of net, like telephone wire cable over that distance. Um, and that was causing uh, bouncing. So when the anemometer spins round, it's got a little switch in it which kind of clicks once per revolution count those pulses to get your wind speed. You were getting bouncing, which is when you sort of get like rack lots of bounces for each click, um, which wasn't happening to me in the lab when I had a one meter cable, but um, happened over there. Solved it by a bit of um, software filtering, just sort of ignoring clicks after you've seen it, which sets a limit to the maximum wind speed you can record of about 150 kilometers an hour. I sort of figured if it's still standing after that, it would be without any data. Um, the sensor sharing uh, terminals was getting irritating, so I did that board there, it only had sort of um, seven terminals or six sensors. So the sensor had a data terminal each, but then they shared power wire. That was just a bit stupid. Um, and John gave me the feedback of being too fiddly. Um, so one of the issues with these electro sensors is uh, you have to, your cable coming from the inverter to, to right from your batteries to your inverter, you have to cut it and put this in, in line, and so there's sort of two terminals there, um, which isn't ideal. It's certainly not a very easy thing to just be able to click other types of sensors onto wires where you want to me measure things. Um, so we looked at other options for that, um, and it was rushed and full of bugs. It didn't work very well. So I was on Skype quite a lot, and poor old John had to learn how to do like Arduino in the fields for the first time. 
which was, uh, well, it was a good learning experience, I guess, but yeah, it was, it was definitely <laughs> ready to go into the uh, So, <coughs> stage, stage two, um, he came back and he was going back out again, so uh, wanted to take some of the feedback back and forth, so took the opportunity of a little bit more time to try and do it a little bit more professionally, it was still pretty flawed, but um, took the data to the board. Now, what Matt's designed is amazing. It logs um, up to four analog inputs um, and three digital inputs, <coughs> uh, and along with the pulse counting. Um, power, blah, blah, blah. Um, since then, he had developed this windshield, which takes the, the pulse input from two anemometers, uh, so the uh, and the direction from the wind vane, and it also records the voltage of, for, for his wind resource monitoring, it's recording the voltage of the batteries that power itself. Um, so, uh, which is fine, but John was keen to record more parameters in the system. So, um, the, some of the analog inputs of the data arena were being used up by Matt's shield, leaving only a few analog inputs. So, I made my own shield still, um, which goes on top uh, and uses something called a multiplexer. I don't really have to know what it does, but it, it allows you to take lots of inputs into own one sort of data or input, which is really useful. Um, and I also put down a state uh, voltage regulator to be able to run the lot off the turbine system rather than its own set of batteries. Um, this time we used clip on power meters, so non invasive, you can just clip that over the wire, um, which is pretty elegant. You can also wrap the wire through that hole lots of times to increase your resolution, um, but there are other problems with them. A bit quickly, got time. And we used a three dollar <laughs> vacuum anonymizer because three dollars. Um, so that was number two. Um, so that's a, a pretty loud picture of the shield that goes on the top. So there's the data screen at the very bottom. You can see the kind of SD card shield. Um, that's windshield is then underneath this, hence the sort of extra chop block to access his port. And then my glue going together, cobbled uh, shoestring ish, was uh, put on the top. And that's got the, the multiplexer chip to select lots of uh, inputs, all the inputs, and then this big black thing which is the power supply stuff. Uh, it's pretty simple. Um, the final stage though then was to, to take that whole system and connect three wires to it to uh, a Raspberry Pi, um, which is what the Open Energy Monitor project uh, has as its base station for them to bring data out to uh, a remote server um, for remote monitoring. Um, and that's yeah, just sort of power connections and a single data wire. Um, um, something I'm particularly interested in is making that yellow line radio over thousands of kilometers um, possible to do really remote monitoring, but outside the room for this. And yeah, that's using a, uh, a tutorial from the Open Energy Monitor site, so I put a link there if people are interested in how to get data from their own projects out via a Raspberry Pi running the Open Energy Monitor gateway. Oh, yeah. Uh, some issues with stage two as well. Um, Paul had testing still, um, and it resulted in an installation sort of running for about 24 hours and then giving up um, with my bad code. And we managed to catch one of them in a phase of time, but um, yeah, it's still very rushed. The, the clip on LEM sensors, have, um, they've got the sensitivity because the, the range isn't between zero and five volts anymore, it's between zero and two and a half volts. Um, and they're just not as accurate as these, but they are so a lot easier to click on over a wire on the base of it. Um, it was a bit fiddly and weak still. Uh, and calibration, so uh, this is very current affair. This is a picture John emailed over of the output from the, from the data. That's, that's kind of uh, every single thing. And then when you average, so these are every second, but when you take it to the, every 10 seconds, but when you take it to every 10, 10 minute averaging, it looks like that. But this is from a 3.4 meter turbine, I think. Yeah. Um, and the scale there is like two and a half kilowatts, which is obviously a calibration issue. So um, there's some issues. Mm -hmm. But it is making some quite pretty curves that are sort of starting to look a little bit like they actually came off a wind turbine. So that's some success. And then stage three is there, is the, the third iteration of the shield, which is starting to look a bit more professional. Um, it's a single sided PCB rather than the double sided sort of center wave one, which means and sort of etch it yourself, it's something I sort of had a philosophical shift about making it a bit more DIY, um, mechanically better. There's a switch so you can power it off 
your USB computer where you're there wanting to read the screen or switch it to the external pipe. It's got an LED that flashes when you get the data. And there's a link to the code. Anyone wants to look at the Arduino code and the shield files as well. Um, but yeah, we'll probably be talking in the working group this afternoon about those sorts of things. So that's it.